Hi, I'm Sandra. And I'm Holly, her daughter. And you're listening to a brand new episode of our podcast, Living a Hell Yes. Hell yes. Hello, mum. Hello, pumpkin. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm very well, thank you. Always lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Especially lovely as we have a guest today. We do. Very <laughs> exciting. Would you like to introduce our special guest and we could say hello? Absolutely, I would. So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Mr. Mike Blissett, coach, trainer, speaker, and the founder of Speak Like a Pro Online. So Mike, it's so lovely to have you here because you have, as far as I'm concerned anyway, you have a very inspirational story that um, I think is very worth sharing uh, so that we can support other people to go through those challenges, you know, which are definitely a hell no challenge. And to actually, how do you come out the other side to live a hell yes? So thank you for being here, Mike. I've known it's... you for quite a few years and it's lovely <laughs> to know you. Lovely to have you as a friend, colleague, my coach, my speaking coach. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. that. <laughs> so um, it's lo lovely to have you here. It's great. It's great to be here. And thank you so much, both of you, to, for actually reaching out and inviting me. Thank you. It's a privilege. Absolutely. It's taking us up on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mike, today, really, what I, I mean, you, you do have an inspirational story. I, I've just said that. And you really, really do. And um, you very much went from being very young, having a challenge that you're going to speak about, hopefully, um, to you finding your own way to overcome that and to actually now use that actually because it's using that challenge that you had it kind of motivated you inspired you actually probably galvanized you to do what you do now so um if you'd like to start telling us what went on for you when you were very young yeah um yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I developed a stammer, a stutter. Uh, I, I only have a memory of it. I don't remember time before, but I, I had a conversation uh, many, many decades later with my mom uh, asking if she remembered when I started stammering or stuttering. And she said it was around the time I started school. So apparently before school, when I was like three and four years old, uh, I never used to stutter at all and I used to be talk all the time um, and they never used to be able to shut me up whereas my sister you know she's she talks a lot but she I, I was I was more of a you know kind of um, whatever you know I wouldn't stop I'd always talk uh, even if it's to myself as, as very young children do and then when I started school I developed this stammer pretty quickly um, and then by the time it got to secondary school it was really severe I couldn't say my name. I couldn't say yes when they started each lesson by calling the registration. Um, and uh, yeah, I used to have a friend at the side of me that uh, used to um, say yes for me when it got to my name. My heart would be going and, and, and I don't know why he did that. I never asked him, but um, thankfully he did. But on the days he didn't, um, you know, kind of on the days that he wasn't in the class, I'd have to say it myself. And I knew it was coming to my name. And, and the fear would be rising and then the sound would come out the y -y 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 -y. and of course people you know, you know folks would laugh in the class and you know start to mimic me and and the teacher depending on the teacher would shut them up or just let them continue and just wait for me to supposedly get it out which I never did um and even though thinking back those each day that was probably only a few seconds each day for me that was a lifetime and it, it was just it was horrendous. So when people uh, talk now about, you know, thinking back to the school days as the, as the best days of the lives, happiest days of the lives, for me, it was, um, I mean, I've got some great memories, um, but I've got some really scary memories as well. And, and, and um, it was a hard time. I was a young, uh, I was a small kid. I was shy. Of course, I couldn't answer back. And, um, and I wasn't really strong as a personality. And so I was bullied really badly as well. It, it's like they sense the kill kind of thing. Um, and not just the, the boys, you know, some of the girls as well, they were evil as well. And not all of them, obviously I had some lovely friends. I'm still Facebook friends with some of them, 
Um, but actually, in a feed um, with some old school friends about two years ago, one of my um, uh, friends from that class, when I was about 14 or 15, died. And uh, so they had lots of um, messages in his Facebook, you know, you're kind of reminiscing and all that stuff. And one of the messages from, was from the one, the bully that was the most evil <laughs> and i've not seen or heard of him for all these years i've known 50 years more than 50 years whatever um and it's weird the feeling that that guy, i checked out his facebook he's just a normal guy with a normal family he looks completely like he's had a nice life um but for me i think it caused me to have a different life yeah. um and for many years i thought that i missed out on so many things because of it but actually looking back it caused me to do things that I probably would never have done had I not stammered and not had those experiences as a teenager so actually uh, only kind of in the last 10 years or so I've come to the point where actually um it's the biggest uh challenge I had in my life was probably the greatest gift that I had because it allowed me to have the life and I live an extraordinary life I've had an extraordinary life to date and I'm still doing it but it, it's because of that if I not, hadn't have happened I probably would be an electrician or a, a builder or have a business or doing something that I I, I I see as as people living in the box there's nothing wrong with living in the box if, if, if they're in the right one but I lived outside of the box um, and that's been for me that's that's been my life journey and I think that's an incredible that has been to date and I'm still on it as I say an incredible journey to have so that, that's kind of kind of where that story started. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And we are going to go on to actually what you've, how you've developed or what you've developed into career-wise and whatever. But before, what just came through to me when you were speaking about that was there were two big hell no's there, weren't there, for anybody really to, <clears throat> especially a, a, as a teenager, you know, as a teenager, uh, there's so much other stuff going on you know you've got your hormones you've got you know there's that whole peer pressure anyway without the fact that you can you can't even speak with you know um without worrying about it but you had two big uh, it, what I heard anyway I don't know what Holly heard but what I heard was two big two big hell no's and that was one you had no voice big hell no and um, because you were fearful of actually voicing because of what people would say or do and then two you were being bullied so they were two big hell no's so how did you I mean I don't want to take you back there energetically at all but so so be an observer on this I don't want you standing in it but how did you deal with those two big hell no's because we can get lost in hell no's can't we it, depending on how big they are we can get lost in them we can't transcend them, which is obviously what you have done, even though you took some of it with you, because as you said, when a few, uh, a few years ago, the Facebook feed came up, it kind of like got you, you know, it's kind of like, a <gasps> so you kind of took it with you, but you still managed to transcend it in movement yeah. forward. So how did you deal with those hell no's at the time? I uh, learned how to be completely invisible. In fact, I'm writing a book with that title, How to Be Invisible. And I don't know whether to write it from first person or from third person and make it into kind of a, a story and a novel kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I learned how to be invisible, how to be that, that kid in class that would sit in the middle of the middle row. Uh, the, my greatest achievement would be not, you know, that I wasn't noticed. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, I didn't set out to do that. I just <laughs> wanted to get through a class at a time without being bullied or mimicked or whatever. Um, but I kind of learned that so that that became uh, a bit like a script that I I I, I learned um, and ran with for for many many years. Uh, so yeah, I I um, and then when it got you know some of the worst times, I I just used to uh, skip school. I used to go you know, register and then um, go home um, with stories to my mum that uh, reasons why you know, I don't know, class had been cancelled or it was home study or whatever. I, I'm sure she didn't believe them, but she, I guess she knew what, what was happening. Um, and so I became invisible that, that they, I'd registered 
And then I went home. And so I guess I was invisible. Nobody noticed that I wasn't there. Um, well, which is, it's not dealing with it. It's just, it, those are the tools I had when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. Um, well, I was going to say, it's, it, like you say, it was the tools you had. So it's not necessarily, are you dealing with it or whatever on, on a psyche level? It's like, this is what I can do to get through it. Which when you're speaking about being invisible, and, and as I've just said, you had no voice, that's pretty amazing when you think about then what you did do um, in relation to, as you know, you're going to speak about your singing. It's, it's amazing what you did do when you were invisible, you had no voice, and then you went completely the opposite way. Can I ask a question on that? Mike, when do you think for you, you felt, um, it feels like there was no kind of relief from it. You know, you were only kind of momentarily escaping from the, from the bad feelings associated with all that was going on. When do you think you first got that moment of, I can kind of breathe, I can kind of relax? Was it when you left school? Was there any, anything done kind of during that time period to help you with your stammer? Or, you know, what was the kind yeah. of turning point where you were like, okay, I can actually see the light at the end of the tunnel through this? Yeah, I mean, there was two. There, there were two. One, one that really didn't work, and one that actually did. The one that really didn't work was my mum went to finally went to see. Uh, you know, made an appointment with the school. Saw the headmaster. I was in the room as well. Like when they talk about you, as though you're not in the room, and I was in the room. And um, his big advice was uh, to say that uh, basically Michael really just needs to learn how to stand up for himself, and which didn't really help. You know, I was full foot nothing. I was a small kid. I didn't grow until I was, you know, in my kind of mid late teens. Um, so that didn't work. I was too shy. So that that was the worst advice. Um, but I appreciate it. that's probably the tools that he had at that time yeah. back in the seventies. What can you do? Um, my escape was um, whilst I was invisible, I still had an imagination, and uh, TV was my escape. Uh, especially music shows with music families. So the Jacksons, the Osmonds, um, you know, sort of David Cassidy and the Partridge family. I imagine favorite, I was one of... My favourite, Mike, David, yeah, David Cassidy. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't a Donny Osmond, I was a David Cassidy. Yeah, I wasn't fussy. I was one of the Jacksons, one of the Osmonds <laughs> in the cartoon. <laughs> and also um, I was on that funky bus that David Cassidy used to have, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, driving around California. I don't know what instrument I was playing, but I was one of the kids in the family. And so I was living in Grantham in Lincolnshire, my, you know, kind of, you know, with my you know, parents and family in the, you know, sort of three bed council house. Um, but in my bedroom, uh, listening to the records and watching the TV, I used to run home from school or whatever to, to, to see these programs in the 70s. And I was actually in uh, those locations in California or in a cartoon or whatever. And that was my escape. And I always imagined that I would be a singer. I was a singer. And that was the escape. And this is what I'm saying. This is um, before Holly asked her question. It, it's amazing to think you went literally from A to Z. You went from no voice and being invisible to being on stage, completely visible and singing. I, I watched, um, I think it was Top of the Pops. There was a guy uh, called Paul Young, who was number one with a song. Um, what was the song? Wherever uh, I Lay My Hat. Wherever I lay my head, that's yeah. my home. I could sing it for you, Mike, if you want. I used to sing it in my every days. I can sing it backwards. <laughs> it's it's oh, a wonderful gosh. song. But he was on Top of the Pops. And occasionally there will be a live Top of the Pops. And at the end of the show, they would play the number one song. And so this is Paul Young. He was number one. He had a funky haircut and a cool suit. And all the girls loved him. And, um, and he sang. And what used to happen sometimes was the DJ who was into, you know, basically introducing the show would then have a few words, a small short interview with the singer. And that was the first time I heard anybody stutter, apart from me. I thought I was the only one. I'd never met anybody else. I didn't do any speech therapy or anything. I just thought it was just something, it was, it was me. And I heard somebody not only stutter, but on, on the BBC, with like 17 million viewers selling hundreds of thousands of records a week, looking fabulous, everybody loved him, and he wasn't being invisible. And that was a turning point. So yeah. I'd always dreamed I would be a singer, and then I saw somebody on 
uh, TV doing it, who stuttered. And then I started to learn some other uh, singers and actors who stammer, but when they play their role or when they ping, uh, sing their song, they don't tend to stutter. And I noticed that, I mean, some of the things that I've done through the years, I tried to teach myself not to stutter by reading to myself in my bedroom, and I still stuttered. Uh, it, which is really bad because nobody else was listening or watching and I was still, I still couldn't do it. But when I sang, I didn't stutter. There was just no trace of it. And wasn't, so, wasn't that the technique, Mike, as well, that they used for King George V in the King's I think it speech? was, yeah. yeah. Because he had a bad stammer, didn't he? So he, yeah. as we know, he was thrust into being king. So he didn't yep. have, oh no, that was George the Sixth, sorry. But he didn't, it might have been George the Sixth, sorry, not George the Fifth. And he didn't have the ability, did he, to get a speech out. So his speech yeah. therapist did the same thing, yeah. I think it probably connects some different neural pathways or something yeah. in the brain, I have no idea. But yeah, yeah, I mean, most stutterers or stammerers, when they sing, don't, mm. don't stutter or stammer. Very it's just something that happens. Yeah. And that, that was the case for, my, for me as well. Mm. So how did you get into, um, cause you were, weren't you? You were the lead singer, Mike. Um, oh, yeah. What, yeah. I was David Cassidy. <laughs> you were, you were David Cassidy. Um, and what was the group called? It was a group uh, called Money From America, which I hasten to add at that time, none of us had ever been outside of the UK. They had nothing to do with America. We just thought it was a, a cool um, uh, name. Uh, but yeah, no, I, um, let's think, I, uh, as part of my plan to be invisible, let's call it a plan. <laughs> I I um I, I kind of just kind of just did average at school. I went to college. Uh, I didn't go to classes. I completely wasted that, and and that's a that, that's a real regret. Um, so I, I got I got used. I got ungraded. So it was really you know. But that's where I was when I was seventeen. I was a lonely. So I moved away from home. So I actually went over to music college. Uh, so I know, knew nobody and I was and, and I had the opportunity, which wasn't a plan to be completely invisible. So nobody knew that I wasn't going to class. Um, the only time it, it, it became noticed was when I got my grades um, months later after I'd, I'd been there and, and, and failed on everything. Um, and so then I worked to work in a factory because that's what you do when you go to music college. You come out of it and you go to work in a factory. <laughs> and um, and I got through that. I mean, they were okay people. I wasn't being bullied because uh, they just want you to work basically. And nobody's really interested in you. They just want to work and get the pay packet. And, and I get it. And, and it was me as well. And, uh, but one of my, uh, and, and I guess my, ex my escape in the factory was I used to sing while I was working. And um, so one of my, uh, I don't know, friends, one of the other guys in the factory, uh, cause people used to hear, hear me singing and they used to know I was, I was a singer. And he had a group and they, they got to the final of a competition in Lincolnshire and um, had an argument with a lead singer who you know, left. So they, they needed a singer uh, like a week later for the final. So he said, oh, you can sing. Um, so do you want to join? And I thought, you know, sometimes there's a turning point. There's, a, there's a something where you think this is a pivotal thing. I either jump and take it or this, this, this might not come again. And so I said, yeah, 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 sure. And um, because he knew I'd been to music college, which means nothing. Um, but he thought I've got all the you know, kind of skills and attributes to be their lead singer. So here I was a week later and we were terrible. I mean, of course we didn't win the competition, um, but that was the first time when they started playing the intro to the first song. And there's, there's a couple of hundred people in, in some, I don't know, uh, college auditorium or wherever it was in, in Lincoln where we played it. And, um, and they played the intro and it was just really, really loud, you know, with the guitars and the drummer behind you and all, all that stuff. And, uh, and I walked up to the mic and we'd, we'd rehearsed in his flat so there were no mics, even though they had all the ramps, plum, all, all, the, all the guitars and things plumbed in, uh, 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 plugged in, should I say, to the amps and stuff. I had to just sing as loudly as I possibly could in his flat to be heard. Yeah. But when it came to the final of the competition and I walked up and of course it, it was a PA system and there was a microphone on a stand and I walked up after the intro uh, you know, was finishing and that was the first time I heard my voice and because you can't, I, I don't know if you appreciate when you're on stage in, in, in a rock band, you can't hear your voice because it's too loud. 
So you're singing to the mic and what you hear is a version of your voice coming back through the speakers after it's been through all the amplifiers and reverbs and whatever. And that was the first time I actually heard my voice and I liked it, it which oh. sounds really weird. Um, but it, it's that was like 27 or something. And, I, and, and that was like a watershed moment. Wow. Um, it, it's like you get the bug and, and you never want to give it back again. That's it. Yeah. Wow. So that was um, so that moment where you were asked, because I think everything happens in perfect timing. So that moment when you were asked to speak, that for you was, the, as you say, it was the watershed moment. It was that liking your own voice, liking what you heard. Whereas yeah. for the previous, as you said, 27 years, for the previous seven years, 27 I hated years, my voice. you hated your voice. And, you know, that's, gosh, when we hate our voice, we kind of don't even want to speak. Um, you know, we don't even want to voice our truth. So, so that yeah. was a real hell yes moment for you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, obviously we didn't win the competition and, but we, uh, I decided I was, I was going to, you know, I was I was their singer now, and so I decided. Well, I decided they um, they had some half written songs, and and they knew that I'd been to music college, which, as I said, meant very little. It just meant that I could read music basically, um, and so I finished the songs off, and so I became the songwriter and put lyrics to them and 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 um, harmonies and all all that stuff. When we recorded some stuff, and um, even though it it became as with all bands kind of difficult because you've got these all, all different personalities. We've all got egos and we all want to be the next, whether it's Duran Duran or David Cassidy or whoever, we all want to be the next thing. Um, and so we, we, I think we lasted about a year and a half or something like that. And um, when we split up, I thought, you know, this is, this is a crossroads. Uh, I'd actually been to London and I, and I, I'd been to a bookshop and uh, you know, sometimes when you're in a bookshop and sometimes as a book it kind of calls to you from the shelf and um, it's not even on display it's sideways and it's hey pick me pick me and it was a book by a guy uh, called um i think uh, i think it's called louis proto and it was a book um God, i have not thought of this for years um uh it was called how to take charge of your life and the subtitle was how to stop playing the victim game and um, wow, I, yeah. I devoured this book. It started off as almost like a slightly comical, light-hearted, silly book. But chapter after chapter, it got more serious and more in your face. So I came down to London around the time when the group was splitting up and just for a day, because I wanted to, you know, I, I knew I wanted to move to London. I knew I wanted to move to the city. The music business does not play, take place in my you know, you know, kind of little hometown of Grantham in Lincolnshire. And so I found this book and I read it. I'm still working at the factory and then the band split up and then I'm faced with a choice. Do I find another band or start another band or, or you know, Lincolnshire is a small place or do I actually take charge of my life, which was what the book was called. And so I, um, uh, I remember coming home from the factory after having handed in my notice um, and uh, telling my parents that I was going to move to London. And and uh, and I, I remember in the book it says you have to get everybody on your side. You have to tell them what you want them, to, how you want them to be, how they can help you. And so my mom and dad they, they they're kind of fretting and they say, oh, you know, go back and say you're sorry you made a mistake and ask for your job back and stuff. And I said, no, 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 that's not what I need to hear now. I need you to support me. Um, and. All credit to them. These 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 people that you know they had their life and, and they had a, you know, hard lives. They were from the country and you know, grew up through the wars and stuff. And but they did. They they absolutely did without question. So I arrived on King's Cross Station with I think I don't know two hundred and fifty pounds in my in my pocket. That's all I had in the world and a suitcase. And just knowing that I wasn't going back. Um, I, I mean, I would go back to visit, but I, I wasn't going back to live in the box anymore. Yeah. Um, and so that that was the beginning. I, I worked in a shoe shop and then I, I worked in restaurants and I, I did lots and lots of different things and, and started doing auditions. I had got a singing teacher, an uh, incredible woman. She, I didn't know at the time, but she was a Spice Girls voice coach. Mm. Um, and she worked with people like Sting and lots of other people, which I, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't meet them and it wasn't a segue into working with them, but 
I just stumbled across a singing teacher that happens to be pretty good. Uh, and so, yeah, that's when I, um, I joined some bands here and then I uh, sang in cabaret and I did some recording um, and I never made it. I mean, I never got a record contract and I, you know, I did sing in different countries around the world and, um, but it was just as a jobbing singer. Um, but I did that for, I don't know, a lot of years, maybe there wasn't a day. I don't know when you do something like this, there's not a day where you say that's a hand in my notice because singing isn't like that, but looking at, at, it was probably between, I don't know, 15, 20 years that I did that. Wow. With, with lots of other things in between. But, but for example, I went to Brazil for um, two weeks holiday in 19, uh, 1990, just when the, um, when the first Gulf War was starting to happen. I remember seeing it on TV in Brazil. And um, I went there for two weeks and I was in a bar with some friends one night. And in Brazil, they tend to have some musicians in the corner playing whatever music they're playing rather than a CD or, or, or you know, you know, kind of pipe music. And uh, somebody had told this band um, that there was a singer in the house from the UK. And so uh, all I knew was that they asked me on stage and it was translated that they asked me on stage and you can't say no when everybody's clapping already. And so we did some Phil Collins covers and Beatles and God knows what. And by this time I came off stage, I didn't realize the manager was in the audience and he booked our first gig um, at the local military base. Wow. Um, paid gig so you can't say no to the military <laughs> at least I, I I didn't think you could you can't um, say so, no to the paid gig Mike <laughs> yeah so it's a paid gig so I started to I started to sing with this band it was kind of a jazz pop band and um, um I stayed in instead of two weeks I stayed there for almost a year wow. uh, and so I you know it wasn't a conventional rock tour like Phil Collins or whoever might do but I did actually do a lot of places around the world doing that kind of thing and so looking back it's just been such an extraordinary kind of journey um, that I didn't if I if I hadn't stuttered I probably wouldn't have been a singer I probably wouldn't have gone to Brazil um, I wouldn't have gone to the States Australia and I mean so many places I've, you know I went to along the way uh, and so that's why you're saying the, the biggest kind of um, challenge probably turned into a blessing. I mean, I, you know, to hear that is, is so great. I mean, it really is. It's, as I said, it's really inspiring. And, and we will speak about you now running a speaking business, interestingly enough. But what kind of what it is for me that that kind of sticks out as so important is that when we have challenges in our life, we can, if we choose, let them define us in a, let's say negative, just because it's easy language, in a negative yeah. way. Um, or we can choose to take that challenge and run with it. And as I said earlier, transcend it and use it and, you know, really um, inspire not just yourself, but others from it. So the fact that you actually went beyond that and as I said you know for two things really no voice and being bullied I mean that's quite a lot going on especially for a young person to know that you then took that and then there you were in Brazil um singing you know like your jazz pop stuff for a year um honestly I really do want to break out into song any moment now but I know I won't because Hollywood freak <laughs> out um <laughs> but it does make me want to do that um I mean it's just you know it's just I, I keep using the word inspiring but I can't think of another word you know it's amazing and it is inspiring and I, I do think that it's an absolute um you know it's guidance really I would say a lesson and I don't like that word but it's absolute guidance for people to know that we can go beyond the constraints that we think we're in um, and you went beyond those constraints and I just think that it's yeah it's just awe inspiring really um, because sorry Holly were you going to say something or 
No, I think it's just really hopeful as well. Like I got yeah. goosebumps when you were talking, Mike, and I think it's just a really hopeful story because um, I think in that situation, it's it's a quite a bleak situation. And as a child, especially, you can't see the end. You can't, you know, when we're kids, we don't think, oh, when we're an adult, it'll be fine because you're just in the current moment and you can't really see beyond it. So the fact that you overcame it in such a powerful way um, it's just, yeah, it's fantastic. And I just wanted to ask just briefly, as you were doing the singing, was your confidence just increasing, increasing? And did the stammer kind of naturally kind of um, lessen or how did that work? Yeah, I, exactly. I, I think two things. One, as someone who is who doesn't have a voice and is bullied, the oxygen is to have a voice. I, for me, it was singing. Um, and have people applaud and, and hug you and stuff because they've just enjoyed your singing, which is um, that this is oxygen to someone who, who's used to being you know, ridiculed and, and, and laughed at and mimicked and stuff. And so, um, yeah, you're right. As, I, as I, um, I, I, I could sing without stammering and the more I sang and the more audience I sang, audiences I sang to, then, of course, the confidence got better. And for most people like I, I i read somewhere i don't know what it is it's a huge um kind of majority of people who stammer it's usually a confidence thing it's a psychological thing it's not a physical kind of you know whatever that's happening um and so i mean just to give you an example i was in brazil one time and uh sinead o'connor had been number one with a song called what was it uh nothing compares nothing to can, you yeah uh, was it nothing compares to, to you? you that's right yeah, yeah. it's nothing been a long time to you yeah. okay um, and uh, the uh, the guitarist and keyboards player are coming in, and this song starts really, really um, slowly and quietly, and then she comes in, and you know, on the video she cries in the video and stuff. I didn't cry, well, nearly, but I didn't cry on stage. And we're doing this, uh, we're doing this gig in a pizza uh, restaurant, and it's massive. I mean, I don't, there's a few hundred people in there, and they're, they're all eating, and it's very dark, and there were candles on the tables, and a, a proper stage, and lights, and a big PA and stuff. So. It's kind of their thing. And, and this is halfway through the show. And so um, the guitarist, Paolo, and the, and, and the keyboards player, they, they do their intro. And then I start singing, you know, at, at, you know the, at the beginning of the song, what was it? Um, it's been uh, 15 hours and 14 yeah. days or something like that. Days, yeah. uh, since I'll sing you... it to you, Mike. I'll sing it to you. <laughs> I'm waiting. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and I started singing this. And people stopped eating and they and they started to stand up and applaud. Oh, wow. And this is in the first two or three lines of the song. And I had a moment, I'm having a moment here, I think I'm, I'm doing this and I'm about to cry because there's yeah. so much energy, emotion. And I had to take a real breath and continue. And I didn't, I didn't cry, but go from a, a classroom when I was 14, having people throw things at me and mimic me to that is just like, it, it's massive. And so, yeah, Holly, when you said, does it help your confidence? Oh my gosh, yes, it seriously does, yeah. And kind of taking that into context, Mike, you know, you then became a coach, a mentor, but now your business, you know, your, um, you know, the, your, your founder of Speak Like a Pro. So, you know, <clears throat> you're, uh, are you a member of, I know you're a member, but I didn't know if it's more of the Public Speakers Association, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a fellow. PSA. Oh, you're a fellow, that's it. Yeah, yeah of yeah. the Public Speakers yeah. Association. And now you, you know, you support people to speak like a pro. I mean, that's what you do. Um, and it, it's just amazing, isn't it? To know that, again, you know, that you, you've gone from that child. You've then gone on a stage in Brazil you know, to being, you know, just, just singing the first three lines, people are standing up applauding. And now <laughs> you, you, your career is to support other people to go out there and speak like a pro. Yeah. I um, mean, when I came back to the UK, I, I was, uh, um, there was a time when I, I just got tired of going to auditions for shows. And so I, and I was doing a day job. I just happened to work in, in a bank and it wasn't my thing, but they liked me and I got some promotions. They call me Mr. Blissett and paid me regularly. So that was, yeah, for a singer, this is incredible. Yeah. Um, and so that, that became my thing. As, as I say, I didn't stop singing. It just started to uh, kind of, I'd done it for many, many years. I'm so grateful for that. And, uh, but there used to be a bookshop next door 
And in the bookshop, there was a book uh, by a woman called, uh, a writer called uh, Fiona Harold, uh, called Be Your Own Coach. And I found that and I thought, gosh, this is a million miles away from what I do in the bank, helping people with their financial stuff. Except that as a coach, your only agenda is your client. I don't have to sell them credit cards or pensions or financial reviews. Um, and so that's when I, it was a very natural segue from the skills I'd picked up in banking to actually becoming a coach. And as a coach, people, some of my clients said, uh, I, you know, we saw you used to be a, a singer and you, and you used to uh, you know, be on stage and do some acting. So uh, could you do some training for us in our company? And so training, I, I didn't go looking for training. It came looking for me. And out of training, people said, you know, um, for example, um, I suppose at the coaching academy, I used to introduce my story. Um, actually, I never used to in introduce my story. My biggest, darkest, most depressing secret that I would never share with anybody was that I used to stutter. So I used to tell him silly stories about falling off stage and all the silly things you do as a singer um, and traveling the world, but I would never mention the stutter. And it was Bev James, the CEO, um, you know, kind of basically at the coaching academy used to say, Mike, why don't you ever mention your stutter? It, it, it's inspiring. And I used to say, no, it's the most depressing thing in the world. And she, and she didn't give up for a couple of years. And finally I started to mention it. And of course it, 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 it was something where people, people were interested in, they found something in it. Um, and so from the training, um, some people, when they saw me training, and, and I would, you, you, as a trainer, you introduce yourself, you profile yourself, position yourself in, 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 at the beginning of a training. Why should you listen to me, basically? And out of that, some people said, we've got this conference coming up. We've got this meeting coming up. Could you come and give a talk? So not a training, but a talk. So again, the speaking found me rather than I found it. Um, and then I, 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 I always like online courses. I've taken them for years. I, I, I'm, I'm the, you know, I've got so many of them on my computer and the hard drive. And I always wanted to do my own. I didn't know what it could be. And I'm, I, I worked with a mastermind group of some you know, fellow coaches and friends. And they said, but why don't you do a version of what you do? Because when you talk about presentation skills and people finding confidence and finding the voice, your face lights up. And so it's like I was looking outside for this thing that could be an online course and I couldn't find it. And actually it was inside and I was the only one that couldn't see it. And so that's where Speak Like a Pro online came from. That's that's wonderful. And obviously we'll put the details in the credits at the end of the podcast. Um, won't you. we, Hole? Because it's Holly that does that. I have no clue. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, you know, what, what a story. I mean, really, because, you know, it's just... It, it's interesting, isn't it, that your whole life really has been about voicing. First of all, not voicing, and then voicing, and then helping others to voice. Yeah. I mean, th th there is something else. Just before I went to Brazil, I, I, um, uh, one of my friends I was going with uh, from Brazil is very into spiritual and, and, and um, uh, reading tarot cards and energy and palms and all that stuff. And I, I wasn't interested. Or I didn't believe any of that. And he said, what, why don't we just go and, uh, well, he was going to get his palm read somewhere in, I don't know, in Soho, Chinatown or whatever it was. And he, and, and he, he dragged me along and, he, and I said, I'm not interested. I'm not going to have it done. And anyway, I got there and I, I did. And, um, and I'm very, I was very cynical. And this guy who I'd never met before looked at my palm and he said, oh, I can see you're, you're about to go over water. And I thought, OK, yeah south of the river, yeah, the Thames. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, 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 you're going to go over different continents. You're going to go over oceans, over mountains. And you think it's only going to be for a short visit, but it actually, it's actually going to be a longer visit than you ever imagined. And it's going to be a spiritual journey. And all I can say is Brazil is that because it's got the African uh, um, spiritual you know, kind of traditions and beliefs mixed in with the Catholic Virgin Mary and all this stuff. And that is really what makes Brazil tick. And so the friends I was with in Brazil, I kind of got an insight into that and did some work on my spiritual energy. And um, so I, I actually came back and I, I wrote a song um, about that spiritual journey uh, of it, you know, going to see this guy who said, uh, I would go over mountains and oceans and it would be a spiritual journey. And so, yeah, so I think it's 
there's two things probably one is the finding the voice and it's also finding myself yeah. um yeah I, I i saw a film years ago and it, it was about um it was basically about a drag queen in in new york um who part of the reason he was a drag queen was that he wanted he didn't think he was enough so he couldn't and it was at the start of the age crisis it's, it's an old film and um and so he didn't have a relationship. He didn't have a family. He wanted a family. He wanted you know, all this stuff, and but he didn't. And so the way he dealt with that was to be a drag queen. Um, and so the film is the story of him finding that he is enough, that he is worth a relationship, that he is worth actually um, uh, being able to adopt. And he did in the in the movie. And um, and he had this one boyfriend that was um, uh, that was deaf. Um, and he, he taught him some sign language, which is not it's, it's not a it's not a, a <clears throat> it's not a deaf themed film, but he learned this as part of one of the stories. And when he's arguing one time, this pivotal moment in the movie where he's arguing with his mother, who's who's um, uh, she's very tough. She she doesn't accept any of this. And he just says, I can't remember the uh, the actual um, um, signing language, but it's when he's when he looks at her and he sa and, and she she says, you're worthless, you're worth nothing. And, and he says, I am enough. And that was just wow, that is incredible. I am enough. And I think something that I, I work with so many I've worked with thousands of people as a coach. And I think if you peel people are a bit like an onion, there's so many layers. And I think in the center with so many people there's that worry that maybe we're not enough and i yeah. think with all the quirks and weirdness that we've all got if we have that core belief i am enough that that helps and i think that's probably been my life lesson yeah i mean that's so true mike i mean we did a podcast on that an episode on that but yeah that's exactly it and it's that whole thing isn't it of when those challenges happen, if you can, I know I'm using the word again, but it's so true. If you can transcend those and go into a space of what's emerging from this and you can um, surrender to that, what's, what's emerging from this, yeah. you can start to feel into that place of it's okay, I'm enough, I'm emerging, it's emerging, and then you can get even as you say, the layers of the onion are coming off and you can get to that place deep inside you where you can then expand into way more than you ever believe. Yeah. Which is what I, you've I, done. Yeah, I just think that 14 year old, that probably the, the thing I got at that time is that I didn't feel I was enough. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, if I was enough, I would have been standing up to the bullies. Yeah. I'd have found my voice mm. I'd have passed all my exams. I would have been enough. Um, and I suppose that's, that's the journey yeah. to find that I am actually enough. I, I might not have fitted into their model of the world, as we call in, in personal development, but damn, I did fit into mine and it took a little, little, little bit longer to figure it out, but yeah. And so that's why I say now I, I look back on this journey and it's pretty damn good because I would never have made it. Uh, I would never have had that journey. Yeah. Had that not happened in the beginning I think that's that's the um yeah and what a massive gift to know that you're enough hallelujah <laughs> hell yes <laughs> yeah hell, hell yes, yes. <laughs> so so that is your hell yes isn't it I mean what a hell yes you know I think also it's interesting what I what I took from what you said today Mike as well as as you started to gain that confidence and, and feel like you were enough there were also you mentioned a couple books for example that if you hadn't seen that book that might not have set you on a particular journey and it's like you were almost then getting signs back of kind of where to go and and what the right thing for you was at that time and it's just I think as your confidence increases you're then able to say yes to those signs instead of pushing them away and thinking no I can't do that and that's just an amazing you know achievement as well that you were so open yeah, exactly, whole. Yeah, God, you sounded like your mum then. Um, <laughs> it's rubbing <laughs> off. <laughs> exactly, but isn't that true? You know, once you open to that journey, like I say, surrender to what's evolving, you, you are never let down. Those signs will show. You just have to also, though, um, be willing to be available to see those signs because other people would have just maybe 
yeah oh, oh there's a book yeah don't worry I'm busy I've, look I've got to go I've got to go and you ignore those signs but you were available to to tune in and to see those signs so that's just absolutely wonderful I know we're, we're close to coming to the end and Holly wants to ask you the quick fire round but Mike I just want to say you know that story is so inspirational um, I, I just think it will support so many people on so many levels um, so thank you for sharing. I just want to say, though, um, if there are younger uh, listeners here, I think you're going to have to Google the Osmonds and David Cassidy and the Partridge <laughs> family. But sorry about that. But when you do, you'll know what we're, we're speaking yeah, about. Um, and, and David Cassidy was always the winner. Um, but Mike, thank you so, so much. Honestly, um, absolute blessing to have you here. So I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank right. you. So Holly, quick fire. Mike, we ask you some quick questions <laughs> um, and then we will let you go. Sure. Um, so the first question I have for you is the best piece of advice you've ever received so far. Um, I was thinking about this. I, I think it's just um, um, use your story. Don't, don't hide it away. I mean, use it, be proud of it, own it. Yeah, I love that. Example of that today. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, what gets you out of bed every morning? The obvious. <laughs> At this point in my life, I I, I need to uh, do my do my stuff, have a week, um, a bit of pop. <laughs> you could edit that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. There's a few things. I um uh, I, I read a book a few years ago. Um, uh, called uh, what was it called? Um, called uh, The Artist's Way, uh, Julia Cameron. Um, about finding your creativity and re reconnecting with your creativity. And one of the things she, she, she suggests is to write something called morning journal uh, or pages, morning pages. And so that gets me out of bed in the morning and that I write my morning pages, um, just three pages of stream of consciousness. And, um, and I appreciate, I live, I live a privileged life. I live a, a blessed life in that I don't get out of bed in the morning thinking I got to go to the office. I got to go to the factory i'm gonna to go to whatever it is i i get out of bed in the morning and create my day yeah i've got some coaching clients and and some webinars to do and stuff and i've created this life and i know that's not quite a normal life and i feel so blessed to do that so the fact that i can get out of bed and mosey over a cup of coffee and write a journal for an hour is is pretty damn good and that's what gets me out of bed i love that that wasn't quick fire. That was a long answer. Don't worry. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> um, favorite film or book? Oh, gosh. Uh, West Side Story is my favorite film. I, I do cry every time I see that. And I'm talking the original version, old school. Yep. Um, I love it. Um, there was a, a book and a Broadway play and a movie um, called Touch on Trilogy. This is the one I talked about, the drag queen, I Am Enough. So that is just... It's Anthony not um, and yeah, it, share, Mike. Yeah, great yeah, actor. It, it's it's not mainstream. It's not Hollywood. It's difficult. Um, it's not film very. Yeah, it's not a Steven Spielberg, Spielberg Spielberg production. Gosh, is it moving and important? So that yeah. would be it. Amazing movie. Have you seen it, Hall? I haven't. No, Thoughts on I trilogy. I would oh, definitely check it out. Then yeah, after this for sure. Definitely great, great movie. And Anthony Sher is br absolutely brilliant. I saw it. I, I saw it as a play, actually, Mike. Um, yeah, yeah. Wow. Song trilogy. It started as a play with is... Anthony Shea. Yeah, amazing. I've got another one for you, Mike. Just because film, film or book, but I think this has been so <clears> about music. <throat> I would love to know if you've got a favorite album, and I'm sure it's a very difficult question for you to answer. But does one spring to mind, <laughs> putting you album. massively on the spot? Album, album. I, I don't know about album. I'm thinking ABBA. Yeah. Um, I, I used to, uh, I think what, the thing is with music, with writing, with movies, uh, I think the, the magic is when you can connect with your audience, when somebody's sitting in the auditorium or they're sat in a coffee shop reading your book or on the sofa and, or listening to a record and they feel you've done that for them, you're talking about their life. And when I used to listen to ABBA back in the 70s and 80s, Knowing Me, Knowing You and all, all those incredible songs, SOS, I used to think they know me, they, they know me in Grantham in Lincolnshire. And so I used to think I was the fifth member of ABBA. I was singing along with Agnetta <laughs> and Frida. So I don't know about an album, but it would be them. 
love that amazing <laughs> and, then, and then my final question then we will let you go is um the lesson you would tell your younger self if you could um be brave uh just know that it's all going to be all right in the end i was so worried so worried that um i was just so worried and so it would be that be brave we're all getting emotional <laughs> Oh, Might have to yeah. edit out the tears. Yeah, we can't all speak at the oh, moment. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> that would be it. Yeah. Mm. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I think I sprinkle my mic in magic. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, well, okay. What will get me back is just thinking of you as the fifth member of ABBA. That will actually get me back. <laughs> yeah. Job done. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Silver <laughs> spangly boots. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. think of you in those boots. And yeah. pants. <laughs> that will do it for me. That will bring me back to a amazing um, thank you so much yeah. mike thank genuinely you. this has been so lovely and so lovely to to get to chat to you and thank you so much for taking the time because I, I think it will really it help so people thank, thank you, you so much, so much mike thank you thank you awesome so that's the end of this episode thank you so much to anyone that's still listening we really hope you've enjoyed it as always there's links in the description as to where you can find me and mum but there will also be lots of links as to where you can find mike and where you can check out stuff from him as well so thank you so much we hope you have a wonderful week living in a hell yes bye-bye bye awesome mum's